All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Prairie Conservation Action Plan's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Kayla Balderson Burak, and I'm the manager here at the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan. So every month, PCAP asks someone to present, either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk at a particular venue, on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. This presentation will also be recorded and uploaded onto our YouTube channel, so keep your eyes open for that link on our social media. And feel free to pass the link around to anyone you know that would be interested or couldn't make it today. At the end of the presentation, I will show you where all of the links to our past presentations can be found on our website. So there are about 90 people registered for this webinar today, so that's great. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Our next set of webinars and in-person presentations will take place uh, during the week of March 13th to 19th as part of our first ever Ecological Goods and Services Week that PCAP is hosting. So this is very exciting uh, for us. We have a schedule of uh, the um, webinars and presentations that will be taking place um, on our website, which I will show you as well afterwards. We will have webinars about various topics relating to how our grasslands provide services for society, including carbon storage, beef production, wetland conservation, and pollination. There will also be two in-person presentations, one in Swift Current and one in Regina. So if you do have any questions during this presentation, on the left-hand side of your webinar pop-up menu, there is a place to type in questions. So feel free to ask questions, uh, type in questions throughout the presentation. Uh, they won't bug up. They won't pop up and bug the presenter. Um, and then I will moderate questions at the very end. So I would like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for this project has been given by the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment, and that this project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Now a bit about Ed. First of all, big thank you to Ed for uh, taking up this, uh, doing this presentation for us last minute. Uh, we went through a couple presenters and uh, everyone got called out to do surveys last minute. So thank you, Ed, for doing this for us today. Um, Ed has been a wildlife biologist with the Ministry of Environment's Fish, Wildlife and Lands branch going on 33 years. He began in 1985 working on wildlife damage programs, then moved to Prince Albert in 1992 to undertake forest-related wildlife research projects, and was the subsequent coordinator for aerial surveys. Moving back to Regina in 2004, Ed assumed supervisory duties for the science and habitat section of the branch and continues in that role today. Ed is now the project manager for Habasask, working with branch and ministry colleagues in the development of the web app. So with that, I will pass control over to Ed and he can take it away. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, I'd like to thank PCAP for uh, working. Uh, there, I think you can see my screen now. Yeah, perfect. Good to go. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank PCAP for working with us to get our message out about Habisask out to you, uh, the users. Uh, over the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to walk through the new Habisask app, and I'll review some of the key tools and information accessible with the app. Along with the webinar, we're also working on instructional videos that will be posted to saskatchewan.ca. And we're also going to discuss some other ways you can learn how to work with Habisas. So let's get started. So why build Habisas? I'm going to present this in the context of what was available yesterday, what we have available today, and what we're looking at tomorrow. The tomorrow aspect will uh, I'll provide it after the demonstration of the application itself. So yesterday we had uh, the government had limited fish and wildlife data readily available to clients. Today, we have an online mapping presence to provide fish and wildlife information through Abby Sask. We're also able to provide clients with access to hunting, angling, and wildlife viewing information by putting it at their fingertips. Uh, we continue to inform development processes by having at-risk species information available to industry and consultants. The app, the web-based app, is mobile uh, through a smartphone or a, a, a tablet PC. Uh, we've also modernized the older legacy apps, such as the Wildlife app and the Bird Atlas, and you'll see those in the uh, in Habisask. And lastly, we've consolidated a lot of existing mapping information, such as the bathymetry and the wildlife management zones, into one contemporary web-based application. 
So who is HaviSaaS for? Well, HaviSaaS we targeted for uh, four main user groups for under the Fish, Wildlife and Lands branch, and they are hunters, anglers, wildlife naturalists, and consultants in industry. So where is HaviSaaS found? HaviSaaS is found at the uh, gis.saskatchewan.ca webpage. I'm going to uh, take us there. I'm not going to use the link provided here on screen. I'm going to take us into the uh, app itself. and. Uh, We'll right here. Actually, I'm just going to bounce us to the GIS. So you can go to the Saskatchewan.ca webpage. This is what defined here as far as the available mapping information that's provided by the province of Saskatchewan. So Habisas, where do you find it on this webpage? Habisas is found in four locations on the webpage under angling. You'll see it here under environment hunting, and lastly, wildlife viewing. Now, for reasons of signing in, I've also, uh, I'm not going to select one of these links, but normally that would take you to the link uh, and then open up uh, Habisask. You would be greeted with a user's agreement. Uh, just has some general uh, conditions in the use of the application. And you have to accept those conditions or agree to those before the application opens. Uh, once you do so, Habisask opens for you. So here's what you'll find. Uh, with the application itself. So let's have a look at the overall layout of Habisas first. There's four main areas. So there's the title bar here. There's the toolbar ribbon, which has the various tools and tabs to view and analyze information and data available in Habisask. We'll touch on some of those as we go through the demonstration. There's the information panel on the left-hand side of the app here. This includes the general information tab here at the bottom and then the layers tab. The information panel is also the location where any results from queries and whatnot are provided. Lastly, there's the map viewer. It consists of the basic map here. There's a coordinates widget, a scale bar, I want to menu. There's a zoom tool. There's the find me button, which will help you navigate amongst the other tools available in the map viewer. So the toolbar. The toolbar, besides helping to view and analyze information in Habisask, it contains two important tools to help improve the user experience. There's the Contact Us button and the User's Guide. The Contact Us button provides a means for you to submit questions to either let us know if you're having a problem with the app or to offer some ideas on how we might improve the application. So you can actually drop down, there's a little drop down menu here, you can select one of the uh, query areas that you're having, uh, that you're experiencing, whether it's uh, technical difficulties, just want to provide a comment, or you have an idea that we could maybe use to improve the app. When you hit the send button, uh, and complete the rest of the information, when you hit the send button, that'll fire off an email to our client service office and they'll forward it to our branch and we'll, uh, we'll complete that, follow up on that inquiry accordingly. The user's guide offers a wealth of information uh, on how to use Habisask, including step-by-step -step instructions for the various tools and functions. And I'll just take you through a couple pages with that. Fastest way to find a topic matter in here and get to the subject matter of, that you're looking for is just simply go to the table of contents and select the item and it'll pop you right to that subject. So that's, uh, you can, find lots of answers and how-tos in the user's guide. So back to Habisask. So let's, uh, let's go through uh, Habisask. I'm going to use a couple scenarios here to help uh, walk us through the app to get a sense of what it provides and can do. So we'll start with the client theme. So you notice here in the information panel there's four main client themes. Uh, for some reason the drawing here on the is a little, there we go, cleaning up a little bit. But there's the hunting theme, angling theme, project screening, and then wildlife viewing. There's also the sign-in option, and I'll touch on that when uh, we get to the project screening, which is a little more, which is more applicable for the information available through that uh, for that option. The other is the uh, layers tab, and you can also find the client themes listed here at the top, and you can select any one of those to uh, pre-populate the uh, the map. What is the purpose of the client themes? The client themes were developed to provide uh, information or map layers that we felt clients would uh, find pertinent to their 
work or their nature of their work, whether they were planning a, a hunting outing or angling uh, activity or project screening, whatnot. So when you select one of the hunting or the, sorry, one of the client themes, it'll pre-populate the map with the various map layers. And again, you may need to zoom in a little bit to get to the, uh, to view the various layers as the resolution changes. So let's, uh, let's start with the hunting. And we'll, I'll go through each of these client themes. I'll give you a quick taste of what uh, information it provides. So you can see once I selected hunting, uh, it flips over the map layer here, and uh, you'll see the various map layers that have been added to uh, Habisask with the uh, selection of hunting, of the client hunting theme. So you'll note that the, the layers that have been added are the wildlife management zones, game preserves, road corridor game preserves, wildlife refuges, bird sanctuaries, wildlife biologist management areas, and Ministry of Environment Compliance and Field Service area offices. So let's, let's uh, create a little scenario. Let's say we're going to go hunting in Zone 64, right here east of Prince Albert National Park. So I'm just going to select that zone area and uh, I'm going to zoom in a little bit to that. A couple ways you can do that. You can use the zoom tool here or you can simply uh, select the area hold down your shift key and it'll zoom in a little bit into that zone. So we're going to turn on the identify tool and I'm just going to select the zone here. It's going to take a minute here just to finish loading tools. So we've got some of the information around the name and whatnot around the zone. Let's see if uh, I'm just going to open up a, there we go. This is a, called a map tip window. So when you select the zone, uh, it'll pop open. So it's telling me I'm in zone 64. And we can view a little more detail about this particular zone and uh, with information that's available has been provided. So one of the first, uh, besides the name and uh, of the zone and the number, the first uh, piece of information is our regulations regarding that zone. So if you select that hyperlink, it'll open up, it'll take you right to the Queen's printer and uh, right to the zone, zone 64 that describes the boundary of the zone and just to help you know whether you're in or out of the zone, you can also scroll through the remaining zones found in, found in those regulations. So that's the hyperlink to the uh, Queen's printer, the regulations. The other information that you can find is also uh, hunting season draw information. So you'll find out information about other draw species that are available to hunt. There's uh, hunting season regular, so any of the regular season species, moose, elk, white-tailed deer, black bear, etc., uh, upland birds, and whatnot. There's also uh, guided seasons are provided where there's information available, so guided for white-tailed deer, etc., so for zone 64. Just another little uh, function here or tool that we'll add or, or uh, some data. Let's uh, Let's say you wanted to go hunt in zone, uh, you wanted to hunt upland bird, you're traveling, say, if you lived in Regina or Moose Jaw or somewhere in the south of the province and you wanted to travel to zone 64 to do your big game hunting and you said, hey, I want to hunt some birds on the way up there. Well, let's, uh, let's look at some other lands that we can hunt on that we know are open to, uh, to hunting and let's say, let's add our fish and wildlife development fund lands. So. These aren't turned on automatic. We've left those at the discretion of, say, a hunter to turn those on when they want. But when you turn those on, you'll see they're added here. Of course, FWDF lands aren't necessarily located, are not found within the uh, provincial forest. They're here in the southern part of it. But here they appear with various FWDF lands. So you can, again, I would assist you on your planning your hunting trips so you could stop into some of these uh, FWDF lands or other lands if you wish to turn them on. and. Uh, enjoy, uh, make it that much better uh, a hunting excursion. So um, let's switch themes now. Let's go visit the uh, angling theme and we'll have a look at that, what it provides. So see all of the uh, zone information, road corridor game preserves, et cetera, were removed from the map. And we've now moved to the fisheries or the angling uh, theme. I'm just gonna shut this off here and we'll uh, We'll also close the results from the, uh, the query of the zone, the wildlife zone. So we're back to uh, kind of square one. So what you'll find with the fisheries uh, layer, again, we're going we're gonna to work around the Candle Lake area because we're up in zone 64 anyways, and uh, maybe you wanted to do some fishing or angling in that area. So what you see 
when you open it up uh, with, with the fisheries locations is you'll have water body locations, fisheries management zones, fisheries biologist management areas, and Ministry of Environment Compliance and Field Service area offices once again. So depending on the scale of the map, you may see numbered dots. So we, we're zoomed in a bit. We're looking around the Canada Lake area again. So uh, what these red dots and where they're numbered, these are called clusters. What the clusters are is simply a collection of these fisheries locations where there may t be two or more located right within a close proximity. The application is able to show those as a number. If you zoom in, and we'll do that here, if you hit that, you'll see that there's actually three locations found at that point, and it's split them up. And you can toggle through those to find out which areas they are. So there's Candle Lake, Musker Pond, and Fisher Creek are all found in close proximity, again, at this resolution. So we close that, there's the number three cluster once again. The red uh, fisheries locations have special regulations connect connected with them, where, whereas the blue fisheries locations do not. So let's, uh, let's look a little bit more at the information available in, the, in a fisheries location. So we're going to toggle over to the Candle Lake fisheries location and we'll view additional details in there. Again, the information will open up in the side information panel. So we can scroll down again, a quick description of the lake. There's the spe special regulations, again, limit to walleye, et cetera, for that lake. Uh, here's the fish species found in the lake. And we can scroll down there quite a bit. Um, there's a bit of fish stocking history there. And uh, we'll open that. We'll have a quick look at that. So actually the fish stocking history is listed in chronological order so that the dates that the uh, fish were stocked. So if we pile down, so you can see Northern Pike were most recently stocked, et cetera, and down through the list. The last piece of information you'll find under a fisheries location is the bathymetric depth maps. Those were located in a separate location on, the, uh, on our previous website. So we can go to the hyperlink it'll offer you the again a link to a PDF document of the map and we'll open that up and here we go so we'll just zoom out a little bit so we can see Candle Lake in its entirety on the map so there's a depth map or bathymetric map of Candle Lake so that's available again you can print that off as you wish and uh, as you need to so there's other options you can also look at with uh, with the information available, we can uh, we can measure. Say, if we wanted to go up to White Gull Creek, uh, let's just have a quick peek there um, and look at the information. And oh, we see that they also have uh, some stocked fishing history, but they have brook trout. So we're interested in angling those. So you can do things like simply uh, measure. We can go up to the measuring tool here. Um, just draw, use a line. You could measure. Say, if we're staying at Candle Lake here, uh, the community. Again, I'm going by, by the crow, as the crow flies, so um, there it's 39 or 40 miles. You can, change the, uh, you can change the increments here to be miles, so that it gives you more accurate, again, to help you gauge on how long it may take you to travel up there if you wanted to go fishing later in the day or, or things like that. So, And we'll just clear those. Let's move to the next, uh, to the third of our themes available. Let's, we're going to jump over project screening just because I have some additional functionality I'd like to show you there. Uh, so we're going to look at the wildlife and naturalist viewing first as the third last uh, demonstration. What happens here with the, uh, when you select the wildlife viewing theme, it displays uh, some managed areas. So there's a terrestrial wildlife habitat inventory. Uh, it displays the Saskatchewan bird atlas data, so those are represented by the little bird icons here. If we zoom out a little bit, you'll see uh, them scattered across the province. Here's the ecoregions of Saskatchewan uh, information as well as one of the last map layers that's drawn. So let's uh, say we wanted to go find out a bit about the uh, bird species that uh, we've not seen before. So we're curious about the pileated woodpecker. So let's go, we're gonna, I'm gonna zoom us back in a little bit, back to the Candle Lake area. And 
let's say we want to look for a bird species. We're going to use the Habi tool and we're going to do query bird species. So it'll take a second to populate and you'll see here it takes one, it's loaded database so now it's ready. We'll just say let's go look for the pileated woodpecker. So I'm going to type in PIL, PIL real quick and there it is at the bottom here of the of the menu, it selected that, and found it for me, and I'm going to submit that. And what's going to happen is it'll create this grid. Now the grid's where the bird icon appears, that's where an observation of a pileated woodpecker has uh, been noted and recorded and provided and, and made note of in the atlas. So we can go into, uh, we can find out a little bit more information about that. And that, here's pileated woodpecker, etc. scientific name and if you wish you could run a report just to tell you a bit more information about it. You can view some additional details so a little bit of scientific and again it just reiterates here's the map that this uh, observation was found in. It doesn't pinpoint the exact location within this 1 to 250,000 or sorry 1 to 50,000 map it just uh, says within this map area pileated woodpeckers were observed. So. We'll close that off. Now I'm going to, uh, let's say you're out and you want to, uh, you're looking for pileated woodpecker, but you'd also like to maybe check and see and have, observe for other bird species as most birders do. What we're going to do, we're going to create a bird field checklist. So we'll simply uh, allow this to open. So it's going to ask me, pick a map, one of the 1 to 50,000 NTS maps here that you would like to, that you're going to be looking or observing for birds in. So I'm going to select the, the point here. And I'm going to just pick our Canada Lake area again. So a little black circle there tells me it's captured that map or the geometry. And I'll hit OK. So there it's highlighted in yellow now. So there's two pieces, two pieces of information here you can look at. So the birds are listed here that are found within this area, so it's quite a long list. Or the, probably the more convenient way to do it is we're going to create a report. And it's really a checklist rather than per se a report, but it'll provide you a list of all the birds found within this map. So we'll run the report. It'll just take a second as it has to load all the data for the selected map sheet. It'll do that, and then uh, it's also going to prepare the report for us. So it's saying now, ready to go, and here's the report. So we've prepackaged this template, so it gives you general observation information here. There's so weather and conditions of the survey when you're out observing for birds, and then here's some information about the biological status, in this case the breeding status codes. On the lower pages, you'll find the various species that were observed previously in that one given map sheet. So you have them there at your at your fingertips to go scroll through. So of course each species checklist will vary in length depending on the number of species previously viewed in that uh, in that map area. So that is the uh, create bird field checklist. So we'll move on to the last. I'm just going to close off these results windows from the uh, previous uh, from the wildlife viewing, we'll look at the last uh, client theme, which is project screening. Now project screening, I'm zoomed in already, so that's good. Project screening, I'm just going to zoom back, go back to our uh, project, uh, sorry, to the information panel. So it contains rare and endangered species observations and ecological protection specialist districts. And this is the map layer that was previously the wildlife app, the older Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center uh, wildlife app is now this one map layer found within Havisask, but you have the benefits of the additional tools and functionality within Havisask. When you look at the, uh, the one, uh, these uh, green circles, sorry, are called element occurrences, or the red bodies. These are all occurrences of a species or habitat that are found within the CDC. Uh, you'll notice here, I'm going to just show you quickly, when we open up one of these EOs, um, and again, I'll toggle over to the element itself, to the observation. So this is saying it's per purple loose wort of certain plant species. Green is plants, red is animals. Um, and you can view additional details. One of the... Uh, requirements to be able to view this particular information is you need to sign in. You'll see where I go up into the right hand corner of my uh, Happy Sask app. I have, I'm signed in right now. I did that prior to uh, beginning the demonstration just to save us some time. Uh, I signed in. 
then in order to be able to sign in to gain further information or view additional these detailed information around the element occurrences, you need to uh, sign up a data sharing agreement with the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center. Uh, a lot of the consultants and and users prior were uh, grandfathered in and uh, carried the same username and password. If you're new to uh, the CDC or you don't have access to this data, uh, there, there's directions here. I'm just going to close this real quickly and we'll go to the information panel. As I noted before, here's the sign-in information here that explains how to get to uh, the CDC web page and uh, sign up for a data sharing agreement. That will get you the uh, more detailed information available in uh, in Habisas. I'm just going to open the map layer itself and just demonstrate here. If you just hover over the uh, map layer, uh, the title will open up. I'm hoping there we go. Just wanted to gray in a little bit there. Click to see. So you'll notice that it says detailed layer. So if you are not signed in, it's going to say you'll see a general layer. So the only, the only information you'll see here are that it's a plant or that it's an animal and there's no further information provided. But because we're signed in, I'm just going to open this again and we'll, again we'll toggle over quickly to the uh, plant species itself. So if we view additional details, there's a whole lot more information provided. It zooms into the selected element occurrence and if you scroll down you can see all the various information, uh, status, etc. when it was last observed and whatnot. So one of the last little functions we're going to do with uh, under the project screening, a lot of uh, consultants need to use this application to uh, find out what species in an area uh, they may need to conduct surveys for. If there's a, a development or some activity uh, they need to do a pre-survey for, hence the term project screening. So you may need to uh, view this area. So I'm going to go um, we're going to do a quick rare species assessment buffer report. That's going to help us uh, to to draw out what uh, the area roughly, as well as uh, determine what species you need to look at. And lastly, it'll provide a report to say here are the species that uh, you need to find or that uh, you'll need to survey for. So information is provided in two uh, two means. There's a table here. It'll take a few seconds just to uh, it's running the data. I'm going to just grab, I'm just going to use the rectangle here. I'm just going to grab a few of these element occurrences here. So we'll run that and go next and it'll populate, well, right, we need to buffer. So it's going to say uh, buffer that rectangle that you selected. I'm going to shorten that down to five kilometers just so we don't get a whole lot of information there. It'll take a little longer to process. So there's the rectangle I created, buffered by five kilometers. It's captured the element occurrences that occur within that uh, that buffered area. There's two uh, outputs. So here's the table of all the EOs that were captured, the element occurrences. I'm also going to produce a report, which we've uh, pre-templated or we've created this report, and we'll open that up. Just takes a few seconds. Sometimes it uh, has to process through those. It'll create a PDF document, a pr print document format uh, file, and we'll be able to view that once it's ready for download. And we'll download it now. And here's the report format. So you get a, a pre-titled. Uh, it tells you when the report was generated, right down to the minute or even second. A uh, quick bit of uh, preamble. There's the map that we had created, uh, the area that we had captured in the uh, in the map viewer in Habisask and then each of the species that was captured or sorry the element occurrences is documented subsequently with that information. So, And that is uh, the rare species assessment buffer report. So um, a couple more tools or functions in uh, in Habisask I'm just going to demonstrate for you as well. So Say we'd like to print out a map of an area, a project area. I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to combine two tools here. So let's say we wanted to look at a quarter section. So I'm going to, we're going to enter a uh, quarter section in here. And we're going to go zooming off to another part of the province. And uh, I'm going to say find this for me. Give it a few seconds. It's got to search the whole, whole cadaster, the database where the, the quarter section uh, is located. And here it's found it. So we're going to select that result 
and it should zoom us down to that. There it is. If we zoom out a little bit, we'll see that it's right on the U.S. border with uh, just south of Swift Current. And uh, here's a little bit of detail around that. Again, found in the information panel in the results panel. And we can, uh, I'm going to zoom back in a little bit more. And again, you could add other data in here. You could go back to the map layers and add, add any species information you want or other uh, background, etc. You can change the, uh, the background in here. So if you wanted satellite imagery, for example, that might be of better uh, utility for you. But we're going to, I'm just going to put that back to the world topographic and we can just print that. So how do we print? Simply can go to the, uh, the print tool. And uh, I was going to mention, sorry, that it's important that the type, when you enter any quarter sections in particular, and, and we understand a lot of folks like to use uh, Abby Sask and trying to search for quarter sections in particular, that it's typed of this exact format. Uh, we're working to add a little bit of guidance on that in the information panel just to specify that this is the uh, format or the, the structure of the entry for quarter section you need to provide. What it does is searches the database, and the database contains the quarter section description in this exact format, so that's why you have to type it in as, as such. So, uh, but to if we want to print a map of this, then it's simply a matter of uh, selecting the print button. It will capture an area here. You'll see in a minute that it's uh, pre-canned or it's pre-selected. You can put a title to it. Uh, we can just put in whatever you would like here. Uh, quarter section. Um, sorry, I've got my cap locks on. Not that it matters. Um, and simply uh, anything of, of importance to you, and then we print it. Again, what it can do is converts the image into a file, into a print document format, a PDF. Again, it's generating that image. And we'll have a quick look at that map in a, a second here once it's ready. Again, it'll say download, and uh, we'll view, there we go. And uh, there's the map. So very simplistic. It captured any of uh, information that you have open. Um, and the title, et cetera. Again, everything's got a, it's pre-templated so that uh, the information's handy and ready for you. Again, you can either keep that as a digital PDF or print it off as a hard, doc, hard copy document. Okay, and last, some of the last tools I'm gonna show you are uh, being able to save a project. So in the I want to uh, toolbar, there's several options for uh, tools, but you can, uh, within this, you'll find the save project. So you can either save the project if it was already uh, created, or you can save it as to create it. It'll simply put a name, you can type in a name, a description. When you save it, um, oh, I guess I will put a title in there. We'll just call that demo. And uh, if we save that, it will open up another dialog window here in a second. So it's just telling you the project's going to be saved, and it's going to be saved. Uh, and this save function, that's another uh, caveat I should mention, uh, it's only available with the sign-in function. So once you sign in, you can save a project. What this allows you to do is you can share the uh, project with colleagues, uh, obviously whether next door to you or across the country or next province and uh, they can open that project and view it as well so that's where you could hit the share and that would be emailed or, or uh, link sent to a colleague. I'm just going to close it for now but basically the project is saved where uh, Happy Sask once you have that data sharing agreement and uh, those credentials it saves that within the uh, that Happy Sask link so I'm just going to close that for now so that's the save function within uh, in Habisask. That is it for as far as most of the tools, the functionality around Habisask. The balance of the tools, um, we are there is ability to upload a shape file. There's a newer functionality coming where you're going to be able to bring in other um, mapped information from other services. If you have uh, data available through another website where you'll be able to enter that URL or web address and open it at, in Habisask. So that's coming. Um, and then obviously just some other tasks that are fairly fundamental uh, to mapping applications. So analysis, uh, again, you can capture various pieces of information areas of the map using different, uh, different geomet geometric shapes. 
again, drawing, you could simply put a, an image on top. It doesn't have any analysis, analytical capability, just simply a picture, but it may represent a project area or you circle a lake that you liked angling at or however you want to uh, capture that. The measuring, I demonstrated just briefly, again, you can do circles to calculate areas, things like that. You can find coordinates, so you can plot in coordinates uh, right now, and you can set your different uh, different dimensions here, whether it's uh, UTM or lats and longs, you can set those as well. And then at lastly, habit habit tools, which I've uh, demonstrated the various uh, query and uh, report capabilities. So that's uh, that's Habi Sask as far as the overall functionality and whatnot. I'm just going to pop us back to uh, to finish off the. Uh, minimize it. There we go. So we've looked at yesterday, we've looked at today, and what's coming tomorrow? Well, tomorrow means today, it literally means to, next day is we're going to, uh, we're in the midst of preparing a number of at-risk species distribution map layers, including around 70 or so. Uh, our modeler here in the branch has also uh, developed 20 plus modeled species at risk habitat suitability map layers we're looking to add. Uh, we're also uh, venturing into the game species habitat uh, mapping world as well. We've got archaeological information from our park uh, culture and sport uh, ministry neighbor. Uh, we have security, uh, water security agency wetland inventory that's coming uh, once they get that completed. We have our forest ecocyte classification that we'd like to be able to provide. There is a new uh, Saskatchewan breeding bird atlas underway. Uh, folks are out, will be out surveying and, and uh, doing more uh, observations for uh, the breeding bird atlas and we're looking around maybe 2018 next year uh, to maybe cap have that inventory or sorry that atlas available. We're developing a new prairie land inventory uh, here in the branch and we're looking to have that information available through Abisask and of course lots of other uh, information that becomes available. We're certainly looking for we're certainly looking for uh, user and client demand and uh, platform uh, any feedback you can give us we're uh, looking for as well so um, a couple of other options uh, if you sign in well not even sign in sorry if you uh, wish to you can subscribe to uh, the wildlife research and project updates that's on our saskatchewan.ca website what that provides is any changes that are made to Happy Sask, whether we add data, change functionality, things like that as far as we summarize them and, re and uh, report them, they'll be made available. So if you uh, sign up to the mail out the subscription, you can grab, uh, it'll send you a notification that there's been an update of data or, uh, or um, functionality to the app and uh, just let you know that that's happened if you want to explore it or check that out when it happens. The other uh, aspect I just want to cover quickly is the uh, government of Saskatchewan, the ARC GS REST services. I know we're getting lots of uh, requests for data from the uh, from uh, the data that's available in Happy Sask. At this time, we don't have uh, data that where you can download it directly out of the app. That uh, be some future uh, version. But uh, for now, we do have the data viewable, accessible uh, as far as for viewing, whether it's uh, through uh, ArcGIS or uh, Google Earth, ArcMap or through Google Earth where you can view it, at least access that data. And there's the, uh, the uh, URL for that to get uh, access to that data. Uh, lastly, uh, I just wanted to reiterate, here's the uh, URL for Happy Sask itself. Again, probably the fastest way to find it is go to the gis.saskatchewan.ca uh, webpage on the uh, saskatchewan.ca website and uh, you'll find those four access ports uh, to uh, to Happy Sask itself. Again, let us know what you think about the app. We uh, welcome all the inquiries. I uh, rec highly recommend uh, using the contact us option tool button, however you wish to phrase it, uh, within Happy Sask itself. Again, it'll uh, select the uh, type of query you have or inquiry you have and uh, submit the email and uh, we'll get back to you uh, with that or certainly take uh, any recommendations or suggestions for improvement and we'll, uh, we'll work those in as we can. But I think that is about it. I just want to thank you again for this opportunity to present Happy Sask and uh, I'm going to swing it back to uh, Kayla. Perfect. Thanks so much, Ed. And we have quite a few questions coming in. So, uh, 
I can start to go over those once you pass control back. So I should be under the yeah. S's there for Saskatchewan Prairie. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So feel free to keep typing in questions, and uh, we can start to go over those with Ed now. Um, is there a way to download the spatial layers? Uh, no. Just as I mentioned previously, we don't don't have any means to download them. Uh, you, what you'd have to do is contact us directly. We are working, and we are in the midst of working on with uh, the uh, Prairie, or sorry, the provincial office of the Geomatics Council. They kind of oversee the whole geomatics and all the data sets. Uh, we're working on a process where we can try to get those posted uh, on our sas.ca website, so folks can just download directly. That's just underway, so we're getting that developed. So there's nothing directly from Happy SAS where you can download. There's only the rest search services where you can view or access the data to use in an arc map or, or, or uh, Google Earth uh, uh, application, but nothing as far as direct download, uh, but we're hoping that comes. Right now it's just a uh, by request, um, but we're certainly working to try to automate those because there certainly is a lot of demand for the data. Perfect. Uh, just out of curiosity, was Habasask a provincial initiative? Uh, did the provincial government pay for the development of Habasask? It was. The uh, impetus for Happy SAS came from, uh, the idea of it came from, uh, actually there's uh, the American counterparts of Crucial Habitat Assessment Tools. Um, that was, actually it began in 2014. Americans had been developing a number of these online mapping tools and we felt we needed to get a Saskatchewan presence out there and not just for the sake of the presence, as I mentioned at the beginning of the demonstration. Uh, why we built Habisas, but to get information out to uh, the citizens and the, and the clients of the province so that they could have that information at their fingertips. That was the impetus behind it. Uh, but yes, the whole application itself was built by the, the province, uh, built by the Ministry of Environment um, through a collaborative effort of a number of branches and uh, culmination with the app itself. Okay. A uh, question about FlySask. If you click on, how come if you click on FlySask, it locks so you cannot go back to the same page, i.e. you have to reboot? We, we get that question a lot and I know our web developer is working t with, and actually uh, it's it's an issue outside of his control and he's working with those uh, in the government uh, that need to fix that. It's simply a matter of getting it uh, parked. It's going to be moved to uh, a, a newer area of um, I guess a GIS uh, support platform, enterprise GIS, so that it's accessible. Uh, right now, the access is still, the username and, and uh, password are still guest guest. I can say that openly to our uh, participants, uh, but it's they're still having a little grief. I know Danny, our web developer, is still having uh, he's put that request in to move that whole fly SAS data uh, into a platform where it's more accessible and that kind of a hiccup where it's uh, become or it's not accessible or it's it's tripping on that username and password is uh, fixed and uh, removed or alleviated so that folks can get access to that data so yes we're uh, we're aware of that uh, that hiccup and certainly working on it to get that resolved always those technical issues with these kind of things as they get up and going mm -hmm. Uh, you may have already answered this question towards the end but does Havasask offer the user the ability to export data as a shapefile or some other GIS format? Um, we have, right now we don't, it was, um, there's the shapefile upload and we're working on some of the functionality when we changed the programming version that the app was built on, uh, didn't have, uh, we had some better capability. When we moved to the HTML, Not to, I won't bore with too much techno garb, but uh, it gave us, it was a decision between uh, portability and, uh, f you know, some other functionality, but um, the download of a shapefile isn't, it, like the whole project as a shapefile isn't quite there yet, but we're hopefully looking towards that coming in newer versions of the uh, the software that the app's built in. Okay, great. Along the similar lines, is there a digitize function within Havasask? 
No, not this time again. There's just simply the uh, those draw functions or the uh, like some of the analysis tools and whatnot. So it's uh, nothing as far as a direct digitization. We are looking around that idea of uh, adding data through the app itself it's using the map viewer as kind of your interface. We are looking, we do want to try to apply the ability to, uh, whether it's data, you know, say birds op, bird observations, that kind of functionality directly through the app rather than necessarily as a separate process. So I mean that whole idea of adding data directly through Habisask, uh, utilizing that, digitizing data uh, through the app is certainly something that's on our radar and something we'd like to evolve. Our what we need to develop in conjunction with that, though, however, is on the back end, if, as data comes in, is also a process to handle that data, whether it's bird or wildlife observations, what have you. We need to be able to uh, quality control that or check through that data, make sure it's all accurate, and then before we remap it as a permanent uh, part of the data sets. Perfect. Under the project screening, there are layers for fish and wildlife development fund lands and the federal pasture lands, but no layer for just regular agricultural crown lands. Is this something that will be added in? Yes, actually we've been in discussion with our agricultural counterparts with the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, we actually did, just completed a presentation a few weeks ago at another uh, meeting around presented Habisask and that question was put out as well and uh, we had some ag counterparts there who said absolutely they have an ag crown la land layer and we'll certainly, uh, we'd like to work with them to make that available. Whether we need to, what we wanted to be careful of is we don't want to be adding too much data where it's maybe if it's available elsewhere or uh, as a service from another ministry such as the Ministry of Agriculture is we want our clients to be able to use Habisas to access it but we don't necessarily want to uh, park the data within the Habisask environment or make ourselves responsible for that data. Similar to the uh, Water Security Agency, the Wild uh, Wetland Inventory, I mean those agencies are the owners and, and responsible for that data but we'd certainly like our clients to be able to access that data. So to, uh, to that question, yes, we're certainly looking at adding, uh, we'd like to add that agricultural crown land layer as well. The part of that process could be that uh, prairie uh, landscape inventory as well. Okay. Is it possible to do a multiple quarter section search or multiple section or township search? Um, good question. Not that I've used. I've, I've only done the one quarter section. Um, I don't know if many of my colleagues have. I'm not, I, I couldn't say that you can't, but I just haven't done one myself. Fair enough. How often is the species of concern information updated? Good question. Um, right now we have uh, Andrea Benville as the data manager for the CDC and uh, we're working on a process right now it's as, as frequently as she gets to update that which I think is around a monthly or every couple of months she'll as the CDC validates and um, approves or not approves, but kind of completes and validates the uh, the element occurrence data, and uh, through their network, through the Nature Conservancy network, and the data becomes publishable to say Habisask. Uh, uh, Andrew will post that data and update, refresh the uh, the data set that Habisask draws from to create the rare and endangered species map layer. So right now, that's that's happening, I believe, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, uh, or every two months, if I got the term incorrect. What we're hoping to do down the road uh, is obviously move remove that uh, bit of manual uh, restriction and just automate as the uh, process updates. It would be almost same day or maybe frequently daily a refresh of the data as uh, data is validated through the CDC. So right now that's, uh, that's roughly the time frame as far as the, the species, the rare and endangered species data being updated. Will the road network and or industrial footprints be incorporated? The road network's in there. Um, I just didn't, it didn't turn on and I didn't zoom in. The, uh, the road network is in there and industrial footprints I think is again something uh, folks can add a shape file if they want to view, if they have a development, they could add a shape file or draw like say there's some ability to do that um, but not really having a, a geometric uh, representation of it per se 
as far as like a shape file, something that represents the exact footprint, but something we'd certainly like to look at, uh, you know, as far as having that available. Um, and maybe somewhere down the road, folks could be looking at, uh, want to do some other analysis or considerations for cumulative effects or what have you. Okay, fair enough. A comment from the person who asked about digitizing. Uh, it looks like they're fiddling around with it right now and they've uh, discovered that there is a digitize function under the drawing function and that you can export this as a shape file. Uh, so just wanting to, I guess, point that out. And, and the only response I'd have for that is awesome. <laughs> and I'd, I'd say more my role, and this is maybe a bit of a cop out, a bit more as a team lead or project manager. I haven't necessarily had the time to play with all the tools, so kudos for them for chasing <laughs> that down, and uh, yeah. I appreciate that. And, uh, that's good. There's probably a number of functions that I'm not aware of that uh, the app is certainly capable of, and I, my apologies if I mislead people, but at the same time, I'm uh, really uh, kudos for them chasing it down, exploring it. That's what we're hoping for. People yeah, exactly. Will enlighten. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you for that. Um, how is this app handling data around caribou habitat? You addressed a current data for other species at risk, uh, but caribou habitat occurrence is defined much more broadly. Will this be something better defined once you add the, quote, tomorrow items around habitat suitability? And in addition to this, how, broadly speaking, how are species at risk range plans and or recovery strategies incorporated? I can, uh, as far as the care, I'll kind of two or three there, I'll address the, the caribou data. We're working with the project leads here in the ministry that are overseeing that uh, project around woodland caribou, and uh, we're just in discussions on how we might present that data or have that made available. Um, we're also in discussions with the uh, Environment Canada around the um, critical habitat so that uh, we can have that made available through the app app as well. Uh, it would probably have some levels of permission set and whatnot. Um, as far as range plans and, and recovery and whatnot, um, I haven't directly linked into that, but certainly something we could look at if whether Habisas becomes a, a medium for that, the habitat information to be available as part of that uh, process or uh, part of other regulatory processes and whatnot. We certainly look for the tool to be able to provide that information that would support or inform those those processes and whatnot. Um, again, as far as recovery and whatnot, the uh, we're hoping with I'm hoping within the next uh, few months, couple of months, that we can get that critical habitat uh, made available through Habisask, and then we'll continue to work on it. Um, Yes, as far as the habitat suitability, again, we're just working with the modeler here in Branch to uh, determine we're just uh, how best to present that information, uh, along with the uh, range distribution maps as well. So I know I can't, I'm not really speaking directly to the uh, recovery plans and, and whatnot. I haven't, uh, I'm not sure how best that might fit in, but uh, certainly the, this information through Ivysas could help inform those processes. Perfect, thank you. Uh, interesting comment here. Uh, it would be handy to be able to select an eco district and see what species of concern have been recorded within it. Is that a function that exists, exists or might be developed? Uh, we certainly had a look at that. Um, with the new, uh, for example, on a little different, I'll use a different example, we'll say then per the eco district but we were looking at the uh, bird atlas there is, uh, where maps right now are presented on a 1 to 50,000 scale and it just captures all those within that. Certainly we've talked about building other reports or other, uh, call it checklist report, what have you, as far as capturing the data that exists within that, whether it's an eco-district or a landscape unit, uh, much as the, the wildlife management zones are already kind of pre-packaged with the game species or the fisheries locations i.e. the lakes and whatnot have the fish species, same kind of thing, or whether it's habitat or whatever, um, certainly something we have on our radar, whether it's an eco-district or depending on what, what scale or what uh, unit you wanted to use to capture that data, certainly something we're looking at to try to uh, create those uh, 
reports or pre-canned uh, outputs that, that uh, clients would find useful. Of course, requests, questions like this, you know, both today through the webinar as well as through the app itself as users uh, get familiar with the app. We, the more feedback we get and the, you know, as more, the more inquiries build around a specific request, we'll certainly start to uh, move that up the priority list or look at a little more focusedly on the, uh, that qu query as far as whether it's functionality or additional data. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, that's it for questions right now, uh, but do feel free to keep, uh, to keep typing in questions uh, while I show you the uh, PCAP website quickly here. Uh, so if you go to our website, uh, pcap-sk.org, um, under the Communications tab and PCAP Native Query Speaker Series, uh, you will see that all of our um, upcoming presentations are listed at the top uh, here, as well as our um, past presentations uh, a little bit further down. Uh, so all of the links uh, to the recorded presentations on our YouTube page uh, are found right here. So uh, just uh, to show you all that, to pass around the link and check out our past webinars. Uh, I mentioned Ecological Goods and Services Week coming up March 13th to 19th. Uh, so the website for that is here uh, with a full schedule of all the webinars and presentations. So you can take a peek at that and uh, if you're interested in anything, be sure to register for those. As well, one more thing before I see a couple more questions pop up there. Um, PCAP is hosting a Prairie Bird ID workshop on Saturday, March 25th. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, that's in the upcoming events tab uh, as well. So you can check that out as well. Okay. So we have a couple more questions. Uh, what does the terrestrial wildlife habitat inventory layer represent? I noticed the layer shows hatched polygons and when clicking identify, it indicates one or more species names. Terrestrial wildlife habitat inventory was uh, created in the early to mid, uh, actually mid to late 80s uh, in support of uh, recognizing lands that we wanted to put into the Wildlife Habitat Protection Act land. So it is a little dated and we're working on some of the naming and some of the uh, description of that data set just to, to uh, note with folks that are using it or clients that are using it that it is a little dated, 1984, but it is, uh, it still contains, we feel it contains some valid information. It was built initially around game species, looking at what game species uh, existed in the province in that decade, and they expanded it to include species at risk at the time, uh, I think a limited number of species, but basically it's an aggregation of all that information and uh, mapped uh, per those species areas, and when you go and look at it, it basically will tell you, here's a species, species within that area that may use it, pronghorn sage grouse in that southwest country and sage habitat, that kind of information. So uh, relatively general. We're actually considering right now and looking at maybe, at not maybe, but uh, updating that to a newer uh, terrestrial wildlife habitat inventory, but that may be, uh, that'll probably be likely a, a, a few years in the, in the development or, or updating of it. But uh, yeah, just the two things I would say is uh, be mindful of the year that the data was collected or that decade. It's uh, like say mid to late 80s as well as, um, or actually maybe a little early 80s as well as uh, the species was focused on uh, game and some limited non-game uh, species at risk information. So still viable to a degree. Perfect. Okay, well, it looks like that is it for questions. So thank you so much again, Ed, for doing that presentation for us. I will include Ed's email in the follow-up email that you will all get tomorrow. Um, if you do have any further questions for him, do feel free to contact him. Uh, there will also be a follow-up email with a couple uh, survey questions. Uh, please just take a few seconds to uh, fill these out, and uh, this uh, feedback really helps with our granting reports. So I would like to take another moment uh, to note that in-kind support for this project has been given by the Saskatchewan Ministry of the Environment and that this project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. So thank you again very much for attending this webinar, everyone. Uh, keep up, uh, keep your eyes out on our social media uh, websites and outlets for the link to this presentation, as well as our past and upcoming presentations. Uh, so take care, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you again, Ed. That was a really great and uh, informative presentation. My pleasure. Okay, have a good day, everyone. Thank you.